Well, today as we start in Luke chapter 18, we're looking at perseverance. And I have an interesting dichotomy within me, within me and I don't know if it's in you, that I have two forces that both are problematic. In one sense, I give up on things too quickly because I think there's a faster, easier, better way. And that shows a strength in my life. I gave up on the guitar after, I think, three weeks, saxophone after six months. Turns out you're supposed to replace that reed. That would have helped me, actually. Uh, I gave up on the piano after about a year. I took a counting class. That is not math. I liked math. And just copying the same number on multiple pages seems so tedious. I was thinking a computer program has got to be able to do this, and I, I quit that class. My track coach would often be frustrated because he'd post the minimum workout for the day and I'd be done in record time. He's like, what are you, are you leaving already? Yeah. Did my workout? Well, that was the minimum. If you want me to do more, post more. I did the minimum because I had other things to do. And I realized that a lot of times I didn't persevere to be the best I could in some areas because I thought there was an easier, better, or quicker way. On the other hand, there's other aspects of my life that I will not let go of anything and I will drive myself into the ground to persevere. My wife and I were talking about this week. She said, you know, sometimes, Chad, you are your own worst enemy. You're so committed to giving 500% to the things that matter, to the things that are really going to make a difference. You just drive yourself into the ground. And Man, that just hit me like, man, that is exactly the problem. That I live in this messy middle between not persevering enough sometimes and not knowing when to let go on the other. And so Jesus is going to tell this parable, and I have been meditating on this parable for months, but a lot this week, and I still think I can only get you 80% of the way there to figure out what Jesus is saying. So that's that's the best I'm going to be able to do today. On when do you persevere when you want to give up, and when do you say, I've got to let go and let God because it's not all up to me. And in this messy middle, Jesus is going to show us when to keep praying and when to take no for an answer and what does it look like in the middle of that. He's going to do that with two main characters in these two parables he tells today. One is, he's going to tell us we need to wear out heaven like a widow. Just keep knocking, keep tapping. And when you're tempted to give up and it's conditioned hopelessness, no matter what I do, it's not going to help. Just keep knocking. Wear heaven out like a widow. Then he's going to transition into a a tax collector and tell us to beat our breast like a tax collector. All that when we face life, you and I won't give up hope. In fact, Jesus tells it interesting. He very much starts by saying, I don't want you to give up hope because life, a lot of times things don't happen the way you want and you're going to be tempted to give up hope. But I want you to keep praying when you're tempted to give up hope. In fact, that's how he begins chapter 18. He begins talking about this widow and he starts off by saying, you've got to wear out heaven like a widow. And then he's got this weird tandem next parable about a tax collector beating his breast. But here's what he says about the widow. He spoke a parable to them, having spent all of chapter 17 talking about end times and the kingdom and when he's going to return. He jumps into a parable and says, I'm going to tell you this parable and here's what I want you to get out of it. That men ought to pray, that this will motivate you to pray, and to not lose heart. So why do any of us lose heart? You'll find out in the very beginning of the parable. The reason we lose heart is because circumstances don't change. The people who are supposed to care don't. Things that are supposed to be resolved by now aren't. And those who are supposed to be helping won't. Like all three of those show up at the very beginning of the parable. He says, don't lose heart when you face unchanging circumstances. There was in a certain city a judge. Let me tell you about this judge. This guy didn't fear God or regard men. The guy who's supposed to care doesn't. And this phrase, he doesn't regard God or men, was a famous phrase in the literature of those days that pretty much said this guy was a scoundrel and he was shameless. Even in an honor-based society, you couldn't shame this guy into doing what's right. In fact, 
there was a phrase used for a judge in those days. And the phrase was Dahanai Gezeroth. A judge deals with the law. But the judges had become so corrupt in that day that they started calling them not a Dahanai Gezeroth, but a Dahanai Gezeloth, which meant a, a judge who's actually a robber. So you want to be real careful when you're called a judge. Are they calling you a Roth or a Loth? Because if you're a Loth, you are a robber judge, not a law justice caring about judge. So the idea that there were corrupt people, but in this case, a shameless, unmotivated by God or men kind of judge is the character Jesus introduces to. Now, there was a widow in the city. And this widow, she came to this corrupt judge and says, get justice for me for my adversary. Somebody's cheated me. Somebody's stolen from me. And it's pretty severe that he calls, she calls him an adversary. And the people who are supposed to be helping don't. He won't help. And he would not for a while. And there it is. Things that are supposed to be resolved by now aren't. It's gone on too long. What's supposed to happen doesn't. Who's supposed to be helping won't. It was interesting, in Jewish cities, when they built a Jewish city, they must always put city gates on the front of the city. These are the city gates uh, near where David fought Goliath in a place called Shaharaim, the city with two gates. You'll see when you come in the city, there are these little nooks or crannies as soon as you come in. And this is where the judges or the elders would be to give justice. So as soon as you came to a city, you'd come to the city gates and you'd have access to justice. So when Boaz, for example, wants to negotiate the land treaty to marry Ruth, he comes to the city gates and they negotiate a deal there in the city gates. But Josephus tells us that women were never brought to the court of law. They were almost considered unreliable witnesses, which was a problem in that patriarchal society. But it was kind of standard practice. So when Jesus says a widow has shown up to court, this is pretty shocking. She must be incredibly destitute and incredibly vulnerable. She doesn't have a husband to go to court for her. She didn't have a son to petition for her. The fact that she's coming to court shows just how vulnerable she is in these unchanging circumstances. And yet, what she doesn't have in prestige, what she doesn't have in societal power, she has in persistence. When she's tempted to give up hope, she instead keeps knocking. Don't lose heart by continually knocking. See, he would not for a while, but, there's the big but, afterward, after what? Her perseverance. He says to himself, I love this. It's like the bubble would pop up if this is a cartoon. What does this judge say to himself? Though I do not fear God or men. So he actually knows it. I mean, it's not like he doesn't know he's a scoundrel. He actually says to himself, Yeah, I know I'm a shameless man who's not motivated by anyone or anything. I only do what's good for myself. He knows it. And this man who knows he's a scoundrel says, Yet, and here's the but in the yet. Yet because this widow troubles me, fine, I'll avenge her. Lest by her continual coming... She wearies me. You haven't answered my voicemail yet. Uh, I haven't heard back from that text. Uh, is it time to follow up yet? Y- you said you would get back to me by this date. Uh, you know, I still haven't found any avenging of the person who's after me. And just she just keeps wearing out with her perseverance. She just keeps knocking, just keeps tapping. And he says, fine! Although I don't care about God or men... Her continual coming to me, I'll avenge her, lest she weary me. The Greek word for weary is that of a boxer giving you a black eye. This woman is giving me a black shoulder from all her tapping. She's wearing me out from all her perseverance. And even though I'm not motivated by any of the things she she holds dear, I'm tired of her annoying me to death. To which Jesus says, if you want to not lose heart, you need to hear what the judge said. Hear what it is that motivates anyone. Hear. Lean in to what the unjust judge said. He said, though I don't fear God or men, because of her perseverance, she wearies me. Now, Jesus is contrasting this judge from your heavenly father. He's not saying, 
annoy uh, evil people and they'll give you what you want. Therefore, even so, annoy God and he'll give you what you want. He's actually contrasting. If perseverance could motivate somebody who's not motivatable, think how much more God would be motivated who does love you, who does care for you. So he's going to contrast his heavenly father from this unjust judge while showing the parallel is perseverance pays off. And when you're tempted to give up, to think heaven doesn't care, and no one's listening to your prayers, it just doesn't matter because you prayed about this particular thing for two years, ten years, twenty years. God says, keep praying, keep knocking, keep bringing your petitions to me. And now he contrasts to talk about what makes his heavenly father different. He says, another way you lose heart or keep from losing heart is you distinguish avenging from revenging. And the rhetoric question, shall not God avenge those, unlike the unjust judge who's not motivated by good things, shall not God avenge his own elect, the people he loves and elected and cares for and chose, when they persevere by crying out day and night... Will not he avenge them, though he bears long with them? I'll come back to bears long. Now, the difference between revenge and avenge is revenge is I'm going to keep track. I'm going to make you pay. I've got a big list of what you owe. And God, we had two lightning bolts for that guy and three lightning bolts for that woman and that person who, who betrayed me and that person who gossiped about me and that person who did that thing to my daughter. We got this list of we're going to take revenge. You know, we, God, you owe it to us. And I want to take revenge in my own hands. You put yourself in the place of God when you want to take revenge. It's a place of pride. Avenging is a place of humility. This widow is us in the story. We're living in a time when the prince of the ruler of the air is the devil. And the devil is like that unjust judge. He doesn't care. He's out to kill and destroy And we don't have any power over him except through our Heavenly Father. And so we have to, in humility, step down in humility and say, God, I'm the widow. I am vulnerable. I don't have the resources to fix this. I don't know how to be the husband I need to be. I don't know how to be the wife I need to be. I don't know how to put your kingdom in practice here. So I'm telling you, as a a weakened, vulnerable widow, I need you to avenge me. You're the source of justice. You are the healer. You are the one that's in control. You're the one that can untangle mysteries. God, I in humility lower myself to say I need you to help. But the hint here is that he he says that he does hear and is motivated by our perseverance... But also, when you feel like God's not listening and doesn't care, it might be because God bears long with them. He's been talking to his disciples, but now he references somebody else, them. The evil people doing evil things to you. The broken world that's resulted in broken things happening. The phrase here, bears long, literally means doesn't lose heart. Remember, that's what he wants you to not lose heart. That one of the reasons God hasn't come back and fixed the world, one of the reasons God hasn't brought in final final, um, fixing of the world yet, is because God is bearing long or not losing heart that people might still repent. And you look at a corrupt culture getting increasingly corrupt. Why doesn't God fix this yet? Why doesn't God return? Return, Lord Jesus, return. Because God is not losing heart that some might still come to repentance. And so when you feel like, why hasn't he fixed this yet, and you're beginning to lose heart, remember that God hasn't lost heart, that people might still change before he comes and brings down final justice. Which sort of gets into a broader scope, which I think might be helpful in trying to understand how on this side, we don't just give up and say, no matter what I do, it doesn't matter. And on this side, it's all up to me. And if I could just pray long enough, I could, I could annoy God to death and he'll eventually do what I want. That's not what the parable's saying. Because there's times you pray your heart out and people are not healed. 
And if you take away from this parable, if I just prayed hard enough that maybe somebody would have been healed or my marriage would have been saved, you're just going to be soaking in guilt and condemnation and karma. On the other hand, if you give up persevering too soon, you're going to feel like you're a victim. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm just a big pawn in God's chess game. But here in the messy middle, I think you need to understand chapter 18's attachment to chapter 17 to figure out what Jesus is saying. He's saying, sometimes in a messy middle, I want you to keep persevering, but sometimes you will not get an answer to your prayer on the side of heaven. So don't lose heart by keeping confidence that God will take care of it eventually. Now, I don't like eventually. I want it now. I want it next week. I want it this month. I certainly don't want to wait until sometime in the future when he comes back. And when you think about that, does that give you confidence? No, if that's God's plan, if he wants to bear along with people and he's going to fix it eventually, I still have confidence in him. Or does it make you go, well, never mind. Why pray? The messy middle. Look what he says. I tell you that he will, God will avenge speedily. Well, it's not happening very fast. I've been praying about this for 10 years. Here's what he's saying. When God answers the prayer, it happens fast. It might take a long time before he answers it. But when justice comes, it's going to come quick. And something you've been praying for for years, months, decades. God will avenge injustice. God will bring about final healing. And when it happens, it happens fast. Even if it takes a long time before it starts. We'll reference chapter 17 just a second on that. I'll come back to that. Nevertheless, the Son of Man comes. He's talking about the return of Christ here. When the return of Christ comes, God will quickly put everything back in order. And in the book of Revelation, there's this powerful scene where God pours out this, this, this bowl filled with all the prayers of the saints. And everyone who thought God wasn't listening and God didn't care, God has bottled up your tears in the book of Revelation. God has counted and heard every prayer And when you thought it wasn't worth persevering, when you thought God wasn't listening and heaven had shut its ears to you, the book of Revelation says eventually every prayer was heard and God pours it out in final justice. He pours out your tears and he pours out your heart. And though he may not answer your prayer in your lifetime, he has heard and he will answer those prayers. So don't lose heart. But will you, in that messy middle... Have faith, confidence. Will he, when he returns, find faith, the faith in him on earth? Will you continue to trust that even when I didn't see how he was working, I trusted he was working? Now let me show you the parallel here between chapter 17 and 18. Chapter 17 that Drew spoke on last week about the second coming, it's all here. Notice the Son of Man was referenced in chapter 17 twice. It's now referenced here in chapter 18. When is the kingdom going to come and what does it look like and how do I live between now and then? Notice the phrases. He says, in the days of Noah, things were getting so corrupt that everyone did evil in in every thought intentionally all the time. And for years, people prayed, 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 God, when are you going to fix this? When are you going to fix this? I feel like it went on forever. But in the days of Noah, when it came, 40 days, one day the flood came. When it came, it came speedily. So in the days of the Son of Man, in the future, God will answer those prayers quickly when it happens. In the day that Lot went out to Sodom, corrupt city, corrupt judges, bad things happen, people praying, God, where's the justice? Look about the vulnerable, look at the terrible things happen. Just in the days of Lot, we felt like God's never going to judge, God's never going to deal with this, God's never going to fix this. But when it came, it came quickly. So, in the days of the Son of Man, referencing the second coming, it's going to happen. So notice all these time words, in the days, in the days. Until the day, so it will be in the day, on the day. And notice the relating to the second coming of Christ when he finally fixes everything, the Son of Man. Now we get to this parable, and he says, I'm still talking about Christ's ultimate return when, here's the days, when the time comes he fixes it eventually... The Son of Man is going to come. So don't be hopeless and think that your prayers don't matter. But also know that sometimes He's going to answer your prayers beyond your own lifetime. 
So you can't annoy God to death and you don't have to feel the guilt and, and karma of it. It's your fault that something didn't get answered. And yet it also doesn't mean that God doesn't care about what's on your heart. Wearing out heaven like a widow happens in the messy middle. We used to go home to a, a church I got married in. And every time we got there, there was a woman, older woman, a widow in the church, Lois Hansen. And she would always notice if there were new people, because there weren't a lot of new people at the church. But when she saw it, she made a beeline for you. Na, 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 And you're like, ooh. And so I, I'd purposely try and go to the other aisle so I could get around her. And you know, she'd she cut around through people. And I, I'm trying to avoid her, because I knew what happened. Because I'd been here last week. We are staying for a whole week, two Sundays at the church. Eventually, she'd corner you. No matter what you did, it was like a football. She could just block you, and you finally were blocked you in a corner. There's no way out. And she'd say, pull out her purse. And she'd reach into her purse, pull out. Photos of all her grandchildren. Hi, Chad. I haven't seen you in a few months. Good to have you and Beth back in town. Did I tell you about my granddaughter? No, you didn't. Five minutes for this picture. I got to really go, oh, let me show you another picture. I'm like, oh, no. She's got like 25 grandchildren. On and on and on. The next week I'd show up, and again, she'd spot me. Eventually, I, I, I gave up trying to outsmart her, outwit her, and outmaneuver her. She was so passionate about sharing her grandchildren and she knew she told everybody else in the church the story. New people were fresh blood. Eventually, I'm like, all right, I'm just going to listen. I'm just going to hear what's on her heart. She would wear you out trying to avoid her because of what she was so committed to. God wants us so committed to the kingdom, whether God answers the prayers in this life, which we hope for and pray for, or we trust that the kingdom answering that prayer later, that we're going to wear heaven out. I want your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wear out heaven like a widow. Now, Jesus, I told you there are two characters. He then tells another parable about a tax collector. And this is not like, and now for something completely different. These are somehow connected. And the tax collector, he's got a main point. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. He's got an example of how not to pray to God and an example of how to pray to God. So when you're in the messy middle, how do you keep that surrendered attitude toward the kingdom? Well, you've got to beat your breast like a tax collector. Before he gets to the tax collector, he tells you how not to talk to God with the Pharisee. So he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves. They're not like the widow who's vulnerable. God, I need you to avenge me. I don't have the resources I need. I need you to be my source. No, no, no. These are people who think, if I could just annoy God enough, God, you owe me because I've obeyed. You owe me because I'm part of the elect. You owe me because of the good things I've done. God, you owe me. I've got you surrounded by scripture, God. Come on out with your hands up. This is not that. These are people who trusted in themselves because they thought they were righteous in their own acts. And in that, they despised others. Jesus, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. As they came to temple that day, the Pharisee, with enough people to hear around, began to pray out loud. And he prayed something like this. Oh, Gilligan, you're so silly, is how he began. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you (laughs) that I am not like the unjust extortioners. Oh, there's extortioners in our city. Thank God I'm not like them. Oh, there's adulterers. Thank you, God, I'm not like them. And, oh, could you see who just came in the back door? Oh, thank you, God, that I am not like the tax collector. Oh. I fast twice a week. Twice a week. And I give a tithe of everything I possess. Thank you, God. You're lucky to have me. There's an old Jewish proverb of a rabbi that 
was living during the days of Jesus. Same as a Simeon, the son of Jehoch. And he said, if God were looking for 30 righteous men, my son and I would be one of them. And if God were looking for 20 righteous men, my son and I would be among them. And if God were looking for the 10 most righteous men, my son and I would be among them. And if God were looking for the five most righteous men, my son and I would be among them. And if God was looking for the most righteous man, well, at least I would be among them. And this self-righteous, self-entitled attitude of the Pharisee doesn't help the kingdom come, doesn't help you live in the messy middle, it either drive you into karma or anger at God because he's not doing what you think he should do at this time in your life. The reason the Pharisees would fast twice a day, or twice a week rather, is because they felt like Moses had gone up to get the law on the fifth day of the week, so he'd fast on the fifth day of the week. Then he brought the law back down on the second day of the week. So they would fast on the second and the fifth day of the week. And all that became a way not of being dependent upon God, but thinking you could demand from God. Now, do you have a Pharisee in you? Because I have one in me. And though you kind of make fun of a Pharisee, I would never do that. I do it all the time. I remember watching on a Curse of Oak Island or something on TV, and while I was doing it, a commercial came up for a new show several years ago. And the show was Naked and Afraid, a new reality show. We are going to drop people off stark naked in the Congo, in the bush, in a desert, and need to see if they can survive. I'm watching this preview, and I'm thinking to myself, what kind of a moron goes on the show? I... Like, I'm going to be there naked, and you're going to videotape me and blur out my private parts, and i got to try and survive while I'm naked and afraid. Like, and I start thinking, like, maybe, like, people from the backwoods of Alabama go on the show. Like, they got nothing going on. Like, what kind of high school do these people go to? What kind of hometown are these people from? Oh, what kind of friends did they have? Morons. Morons go on this kind of show. So I forgot about it. Several years later, I'm, I'm, I'm in Facebook. I'm going through my news feed. And what pops in my news feed is, five-year reunion for Naked and Afraid showing up. Can't wait. It's in my news feed. And it doesn't say sponsored underneath it. Like, who in the world do I know that's excited about the Naked and Afraid? Click. Tara. Tara. Five-year reunion from my first time on the Naked and Afraid TV show, can't wait to go back for the reunion. And suddenly it hit me. Tara sat behind me in ninth grade biology class. <laughs> what kind of person goes on naked and afraid? My friends. <laughs> from my hometown. From my city. And what's worse is she's become kind of a tantra specialist nature consultant now and she said I learned so much she had a picture pasted on her Facebook page of what happened to her apparently I didn't watch the episode Uh, apparently she was hot and she came across this pool of water with look real refreshing she goes in the water not knowing it was filled with parasites she's got a picture of her her I think it was leg or her her arm and it looked like she turned into a human porcupine like parasites she had like these uh, blisters and bumps all over her like a human porcupine. She's like, yeah, that's what happened to me on the episode. But you know what? My time on Naked and Afraid just had me so connect with nature. And I love nature. And I want other people to connect with nature too. And now I'm reading this on her Facebook page and I'm thinking, what a moron. You know, what a moron. My worldview, the Christian worldview is so much better. Nature is broken. Nature hates you, Tara. Nature tried to kill you. Why are you trying to get people to connect with this thing? It turned you into a human porcupine. My worldview is better than yours. My observations are better used. My application conclusions are better than yours. What is wrong with you? Oh, there's that Pharisee. Our Christianity makes us better. Our decisions make us better. The TV shows we like are better. Only people like me bring the kingdom. I sitting at dinner one uh, evening, and my grandmother, a very opinionated woman, 25 years as a kindergarten teacher, and then built her own real estate firm. She was a broker, my grandpa, and she built Hoven Realty, which was a very successful business in our tri-county area. And right behind the lot where they had built their real estate company was a field. 
So she came over for dinner that day because my grandma never cooks. She always wanted anyone else to cook for her. So she showed up and she's like, Ross, that's my dad. You're not going to believe what I saw today. What happened, mom? Middle of the day, somebody who clearly needs a job took their motorcycle and rode on our property on that back field, around and around and around. And worse than that, on the front of the motorcycle, he had like a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old boy on the front of that thing. And I'm thinking, does this, does this man not have a job? Does this man not care about his kids? What kind of, what kind of parents and upbringing? I can, the, the five-year-old, it's not his fault, but you'd think that young man, that 30-year-old man, you'd think like maybe he should have had a mother who taught him how to do right from wrong. She finishes his big speech. My dad bursts out laughing and says, Mom, that was me. And that was Chad on the front of the motorcycle. And my dad used to take this broom handle, which he cut off. He strapped it directly underneath the gas tank. And so I used to sit in front of him on the motorcycle. It was about a quarter mile from our house. And so my dad was a school teacher. And so during the months of the summer, often we'd go up and do a little motorcycle ride. And all of a sudden, my grandmother had to realize she was the mother who had not taught her son how to be a decent dad. But don't we do it all the time? We know how to parent differently. We know how to grandparent better. We know how people should spend their life and what wasting time looks like. There's a Pharisee in all of us. And that's why Jesus says, I don't want you to talk to God like a Pharisee. I want you to talk to God like a tax collector. The tax collector humbles himself that God would exalt him. So what does the tax collector do? How will he react in this moment? Well, this is a contrast to getting in front of everybody. The tax collector stood afar off from the temple. He, he wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven to pray. But he just kept beating his chest. And the Greek term here is it just, it's a continual action. And he says, God, be, be merciful to me. And yet the word he uses for merciful isn't the typical merciful word. Literally, he says, God, be propitious for it to me. God, be my propitiation. Which is a way of saying, God, I I don't need more chances. I'll just screw it up. I need somebody to be my propitiation. Somebody to pay my ransom for me. Someone to pay for me what I cannot do for myself. Ah, do you see the widow again? Someone who's independent. I, I can't solve this. I can't overcome the corrupt judge. I can't fix this broken in the world ruled by the devil. God, you need to avenge me. The tax collector who just kept focusing on his own inadequacy and his need for God. Be propitious. Pay my ransom for me. And Jesus said, I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified because he asked God to pay For what he had done. God to take care of what he couldn't. Versus the other thought he could do it himself. For everyone who humbles himself. Will be exalted. Versus the Pharisee who exalted himself. Was humbled. So if you want to know how to bring the kingdom. Continual focus on humility. And dependence. And God, you got to work here because I can't. And I'm smart, but I can't figure this out. And i got a lot of resources, but I am woefully inept at justifying myself and avenging myself. Without becoming a narcissist, without becoming it's all about me and sort of being covered in my own karma and thinking I can annoy you to death. God, help me know how to live in the messy middle. In humble surrender to your kingdom. Now or later. So what does it mean to persevere? Well, it means we wear out heaven like a widow. We don't give up and think our prayers don't matter. But it also means we don't think that we can demand from God that he's got to do it because we know better than him. We've got to have humility and beat our breasts like a tax collector. So as you face whatever you're facing, and maybe it's something you've been praying for for years, and you've given up, there's certain prayers you've given up on, I would just encourage you, don't lose heart. God wants you to know he hears and he cares. He carries your tears and he carries your prayers. And maybe your personality, usually our personalities are on one side of the spectrum, right? Either you're a a give up too soon, doesn't matter. Or you're like me, I'm I'm going to eventually annoy somebody to death until they get back to me. 
And Jesus' parable challenges us both to live in dependence on him in the middle of God. I want to keep praying, but I'm going to keep trusting. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this powerful reminder of what perseverance looks like. Teach us how to live the life you've called us to. And show us how we can trust our heavenly Father, who's so unlike the unjust judge. May we be people of prayer and people of trust that you will find real faith on earth when you return. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today.